today's event is special for us. It's part of the MLK Convocation Week. We're really delighted, Convocation Month, forgive me. We're really delighted to have um, this particular guest with us today. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium my colleague in the theology department, Sandra Keating, who will introduce today's guest. Welcome everyone. It's uh, it's really nice to see so many students out on Friday afternoon. We always hope that uh, you take an opportunity before you head out for the evening to come by the Humanities Forum. Um, today we are especially honored to have uh, to host Dr. Anika Prather for our Humanities Forum lecture. Dr. Prather has uh, earned multiple degrees from Howard University, New York University, and St. John's College in Annapolis, after which she earned her PhD in English, theater, and literacy education at the University of Maryland. She currently teaches classics at Howard University. Dr. Prather is well known for her work in building literacy with African-American students through engagement with the canon. In 2018, she uh, published a book entitled Living in the Constellation of the Canon, the lived experiences of African-American students reading great books literature. In it, she follows the experience of African-American students who participated in a great books literature class that she taught and draws out particular insights and wisdom that they gain and examines how that impacted their lives later on. Dr. Prather is also the founder of the Living Water School in Southern Maryland. It's a unique Christian school for independent learners based on the educational philosophies of classical education and the Sudbury model. Dr. Prather is a performing artist and incorporates uh, music, drama, storytelling into most of her presentations. And she has produced and written songs for her two jazz albums, uh, you can find a link for that on her website. If you want to see that, let me know and I can send it to you. And she and her husband, Damon, have three young children and reside in the DC metropolitan area. And so without further ado, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, Dr. Anika Prather. Well, thank you everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm so grateful to be here with you. I am very thankful for Zoom because I don't know how possible this would have been without it. Life is very crazy right now with um, uh, the virus and just my new responsibilities at Howard University. I believe when this was first discussed, um, it was either I had just started working or didn't know I was going to be working full time at Howard. And I'm now picked up a position at the University of Maryland as well. So, but I wanted to be here and I wanted to share my story with you and hope that it resonates with you and just a little bit of news, my school this week just moved everything to Virginia. Um, we found that the state of Virginia was a lot more supportive of private schools and um, uh, unique philosophies of schools. So we are there, we just signed the lease on our new building right in the middle of Old Town Alexandria. So if you're ever in the DC area, stop by and visit us. And this building is really special and it really connects to what we're talking about today. And, and me finding the building is, is, if we had time, I would tell you about the miracle, but us deciding to move to Virginia, finding this building and everything happened within a seven day period. And, and so when I finally found this building, which was built in 1900, it sits on King Street, which is a very main historic street in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. And it's an old house. And um, when I when I got it, I first my thoughts were just to you know have a space for the school, but there's a upstairs part that I plan to turn into a small little space where people can come and kind of like a museum and learn about the black classical tradition so people can understand its story. Right now I'm kind of scattered all over the world, speaking on Zoom, flying every now and then. And the, the message is out there. I felt like if people have a space where they can come and get brochures and pamphlets and a little uh, bookstore will be there where you can buy books that we feel connect to this story. And you can look at the walls and see the pictures and life stories of those who have been supportive of the black classical tradition and, and the champions of it. Uh, you will find it right in Old Town Alexandria, hopefully within the next 365 days that will be ready. So I'll be sure to let all of the people who have been supporting my work know about its existence. So if you ever come to tour DC, you'll stop by the little tiny, we're gonna call Blacks and Classics Museum. So 
the, and I, I'm starting that museum because I, I feel like this work is very important. I don't want it to be lost in people's ears. Oh, you know, you sit, how many of us sit in lectures and you hear it sounds good at the time, you write notes, and then you go on about your way. Well, this time, if you, you know, feel like you need a refresher in what I share with you today, there will be a space you can come and, and learn more about it or refresh your memory from whatever you've heard today. And I find this story so important because, and this has been a, an evolution for me. When I first discovered the value of studying classics and the works of the canon, it was very emotional. It didn't have anything to do with black history. So black history did not bring me to the canon at first, which I think that's important for you to know. My love for classics and the canon and the great books and the great conversation was just a straight emotional connection. I found that these texts told my story, your story, everyone's story. And it's almost like something I had been looking for my entire life, God had finally given to me to find. And what was that? What can connect us all? Why can it connect us all? Because it, you can, anyone can identify with the stories that are there, with the philosophies that are there. Um, and so I, as soon as I opened it up, I was in my 30s. You all are blessed. You're, you're coming to possibly read these things a lot sooner than I did or to value them a lot sooner than I did. I was in my 30s. But the moment I opened, I believe it was Aristotle, and I can't remember which one it was. I believe it was Parts of Animals. I was immediately hooked. And I was actually kind of mad at myself that I, I bought into the lie that these books are not for me. So for all of those years, I knew about them. But I was the champion. I was the one to say, no, we need to be reading more of our literature from Toni Morrison and Zora Neale Hurston and Martin Luther King and Du Bois and Baldwin, not realizing that they had actually read these same texts, probably for the very same reasons that I was doing at that moment, as I felt that connection. I felt liberated. My mind felt liberated. My soul felt liberated. And I found that I felt I had discovered kind of like just the answers to this space we call life. And so it started there. And then I began to teach great books, a great books class at a school. My parents, um, who were avid readers, decided to start a classical school for black students. It's not explicitly for black students, but it's located in an all black neighborhood, one of the most lowest income areas of Maryland in PG County. And I just thought it was so odd. Why would you put a classical school there? <laughs> What are they going to have? Any, what will they have to do with this stuff? And my parents, who are a lot more stubborn than I am, did not pay me any mind, and they decided to open this school. And I was on the end of my public school career, and I wanted to change, and I wanted to be in a place where I could explore other ways of learning. I could be a little bit more free in, in my faith. So I decided to join their faculty, but I was very clear, don't ask me to teach those books for white people. I will teach music and drama only. And so if, I, if you just let me be happy in my little corner of teaching the performing arts, I think I can still be a blessing in this space. Not too long after that, I was walking down the halls, probably within the first few weeks of me working there, and I happened upon a great books class. And the teacher was a high school class and the teacher was just struggling to get the students to engage with the text. Well, I said, what's going on? How can I help you? I always tell people this part of the story I feel was a setup by God. I feel like I was tricked because I had been resistant. But when I saw the students not engaging, that's my weakness. I don't, I, don't, I don't like it when students aren't engaging in education. I have a real passion for education. So I said, how can I help you? And she said, I don't know. I can't get them to connect it. I said, well, let me use some music and drama to help them connect to the text. And I had to take the books home. And I had to read and study the text that we were going to do that, day, that week. And that was where my love affair with the canon, great books, classics began. And I think the best way to describe why is a quote by Socrates. So hopefully I can share here. Yes. And um, hold on, let me get this so that it's slideshow. 
And this quote by Socrates is one of my favorites. And he says, I am not an Athenian or Greek, but a citizen of the world. The moment I began to read from the canon, I felt the color lines disappear. And we're gonna take a look at a quote by Du Bois where he poetically expresses exactly how classics is able to help you step over those color lines. I'll leave this up for a minute if anybody wants my contact information. And so the title of this, of this uh, talk is The Great Books of Polaris for African-American People. The word Polaris is the same thing as North Star. And everything, especially during the time of enslavement, any, any signs of freedom, somehow they connected to Polaris. And that's because the Polaris was used to help African, the African people find their way to freedom if they escaped. Here are another couple of other verses I like, and you, whether you're a Christian or not, I feel like they say the same thing as Socrates. And it says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one. I always stop if you're a believer, you can go on and finish the sentence in Christ Jesus. If you're not, I feel like the beginning of that is still true. Then the other one I love is for there's no respect of persons with God. And it's the same thing. Even if you don't believe in God, there should be no respecter of persons. That is the human life. And when I read the, the classics, especially the ancient texts, I feel like they seem to understand, um, even though it was definitely had its own vices, there was definitely some prejudices there, but this color line that has plagued our country for so many years didn't to, seem to be as prevalent there. And I felt that as soon as I began to read. So the purpose of this journey I wanna take you on today is to show you how classics can be used to bring unity. God wants unity, especially amongst his people, but especially in our world. So I, I start off with the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. This is the preamble. This is how the constitution begins. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, Tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, when this was written, my ancestors were still enslaved. And even though there's no fine print that says, we the people except African Americans, we the people except whoever else, there's no fine print in that. I think that was on purpose. I believe the founding fathers purposely, even though they had their own challenges, some, not all, owned slaves, I think they intentionally did not put fine print on that. And this story about classics being a Polaris is about how Black people use classics to find themselves included in this preamble and the overall vision of the Constitution. So, I, I chose for my dissertation and, and the book, my, my dissertation has been turned into a book. You can buy it on Amazon called um, Living in the Constellation of the Canon. I chose that metaphor because I'm gonna share with you interwoven in these stories, I'm gonna tell you about blacks and classics. Interwoven is gonna be the song connected to an old folk tale called Follow the Drinking Gourd. And it tells the story of an enslaved family who one of the children is is going to be sold away from the family. And so the family decides to run away so that no one is sold and separated from them. And the main thing they use to get to freedom is the drinking gourd. Now I'm gonna sing, I love to sing if you don't mind. As I sing verses of this song, cause the, the story is connected to also a song. I want you to and let this repeat in your mind as I go that the, the, whenever you see drinking gourd, think classics. And what is the drinking gourd? It was, it was a, 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 a disguised way that the enslaved people were referring to the Big and Little Dipper. 
Why is that important? Because they knew if they could see that constellation, they would find the North Star. And if they kept that North Star in front of them, they would escape to freedom. And we're gonna look at some slaves who escaped, Harriet Tubman being one of them, by following the drinking gourd. In this story, I'm gonna tell you, classics and many of the works of the canon functioned also as a drinking gourd. When the sun comes back, and the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. For the old man's a waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. So here we go, evidence of the knowledge of the enslaved people. Cold language for the Big Dipper and the North Star. They knew if they had those constellations in place, they would find freedom. There was something else that was a Polaris to them. It was the classics and we see it in the lives of many African-Americans. So going back to this concept of the Polaris, of the North Star being their way to freedom, as Slave Lord tells it, the North Star played a key role in helping slaves find their way. Many former slaves, including historical figures like Tubman, Harriet Tubman, used the celestial gourd or dipper to guide them on their journey north. The term became synonymous with freedom in the language of the enslaved pe people. In fact, Frederick Douglass, when he became freed and became an abolitionist, he started a, north, a newspaper called the North Star. The river bank makes a mighty good road. The dead trees will show you the way. Left leg, peg leg, traveling on. Follow the drinking gourd. So how were these texts, say, a Polaris for someone like Frederick Douglass? Like this song is a map to freedom, following the light of the North Star, Frederick Douglass and others also followed another light to freedom the light of literacy found in classic texts. So when Frederick Douglass was a little boy, he was about five or six, he had no mother. He was sold away from his mother as a baby and to a whole other plantation. For the first five years of his life, his mother would walk, after she got out of the fields late at night, she would walk from her plantation, which was located quite far from where he was now, and she would walk to tuck him in at night until he fell asleep. She dies. And he's just alone, motherless, fatherless. He is, they, they believe he is the son of the slave master, but he had no one to care for him, even as a child. But the slave master's wife, who he had just kind of recently married, she had never owned slaves herself, took a liking to Frederick Douglass. And she thought he was the brightest, smartest little boy. And she began to teach him how to read. One day the master comes in on one of their reading lessons and he says, oh my goodness, stop. Do not teach him to read. And I'm, I'm going to use the language here not to offend anyone, but so you can see how, uh, how these words have affected Frederick Douglass. If you, and he says, and this is what the slave master says to the slave, to his wife, in front of little five or six-year-old Frederick Douglass. And you know, it's so interesting because Frederick Douglass must have been a really smart little boy. I have three children. Let me, let me just stop so you can see my expression. I have three children. None of them wanted to learn to read. <laughs> None of them had any interest. Like my daughter especially has fought me tooth and nail on this reading journey. I'm thanking God she finally knows how to read at seven. This is why I love teaching my children at home <laughs> so they can work through these issues. So here Frederick Douglass is at five or six and watch how when this master says this to his wife in front of him, He's five or six, watch his response. So, the, so the, the master says, if you teach that nigger how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever make him unfit to be a slave, it would make him discontented. At this time, reading for enslaved people, like they understood the danger of reading so much that it was made, it, it was against the law for a slave or a black person to own a book. Frederick Douglass was five or six, and he decides at that moment, he says, at whatever cost, 
I was going to make sure I knew how to read. All right, so fast forward a little bit more, about 12 years old, he's walking around Baltimore one night, one day, and he comes across this old bookstore owned by some Methodist minister or, or leader. And he finds this text called the Columbian Order. He specifically wanted the Columbian Order because the Columbian Order was one of the main texts used in those early American schools. It was, a, it was an anthology of, class, of excerpts of classic works, speeches from ancient times and beyond, religious texts, and many children. So my guess is, and this is the story of most enslaved people, they would kind of keep an eye on what the master's children were learning or the local children were learning, what books were they carrying. And they would try to get those books themselves because they felt like their liberation, their mental liberation somehow were fine, was found in those texts. So he goes to this old bookstore, collects this book. And before the Methodist minister gives it to him, he kind of looks around. He says, listen, I'm going to sell you this book. Frederick Douglass had a few nickels, pennies in his hand from some odd jobs he had done. He says, don't, don't you ever tell where you got it. And Frederick Douglass kept his promise. You have to research to find this story. You can find a documentary on it on YouTube. A news channel did a special on it. But in his autobiography, Frederick Douglass never tells. He always just says, I somehow got my hands on this book called The Columbian Orator. Okay, so, so the master's words to Douglas were harsh but true. There was a reputation that whenever black people got their hands on a book, and these weren't just any books. Frederick Douglass was not alone. He wasn't the only black person, black enslaved person who wanted to read classic texts or found some value in reading them. It was so common that they had to make a law outlawing books. There are stories of enslaved people sneaking into the master's library to steal books like Robinson Crusoe and others off of the master's library. From the moment he was exposed to literacy, even though the mistress was made to stop, Douglas was compelled to read. And this, so he, he imagine this 12 year old boy. He doesn't escape to freedom till he's about 20. He gets this book. He makes it back to his little slave cabin, wherever he's sleeping. And, he, and he's opening these, this book. And in, in his moment, he says, there's another quote where he says, right when I got this book, I had just come to the place of utter despair that I would always live the life of a slave. And then I got my hands on this book. And this is what he says. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering. It was a new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things. I set out with high hope and a fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn to read. These words sank deep into my heart. And so that darkness, he was in darkness, he said. I was in utter despair. One of my favorite authors is John O'Donohue. He writes, a, he wrote a book called Anamkara. And it's about what human beings go through to become connected with each other. And I feel like there's this one part of this book that explains what Frederick Douglass went through, that moment he learned to read, that moment he got the Columbian orator. And if you read this, you can connect this. And he says, and oh, John O'Donohue, not Frederick Douglass, don't want to confuse you. He says, we are always on a journey from darkness to light. At first, we are children of darkness. Frederick Douglass was definitely a child of darkness. Your body and your face were formed first in the kind darkness of your mother's womb. Frederick Douglass was born to a slave mother who loved him so much. And for a brief moment, she was able to give him a mother's love. And he says, your birth was first a journey from darkness to light. He's born into this world of captivity. And almost as soon as he comes into the world, he is placed on another plantation. And I feel like I always, I have this theory about Frederick Douglass's mother. Those five years where she walked late at night through all types of dangers just to see her baby boy. I have this theory because I'm a mother and I did this with my own children and it really works, where she was whispering something to his mind to keep the light on. They say Frederick Douglass was so intelligent, you could see it in his eyes. Like his look was intimidating to his slave masters. He had a look of, they say he had a look of high intelligence, even as a child. 
that look is what captivated the master's wife so much that she wanted to teach him how to read. And I, I'm not one of those, I'm kind of skeptical, skeptical when they talk about gifted children. I don't believe anyone's born gifted. It's just, a, I've been in education for a long time, but I believe that children, the parents pour something into their children from the womb, from birth that awakens the intellect in them at a young age. And I think that mother did something. There was something she was whispering into that baby boy, Frederick Douglass's ear, as she put him to sleep for those five years. And she gave him just enough to awaken his mind. And so here he is, he has this text, right? And he's going on this journey that O'Donohue is, is explaining. And he says, the miracle, okay, your birth was first a journey from darkness to light. The miracle of thought is its present in the night side of your soul. The brilliance of thought is born in darkness. Light is the mother of life. Frederick Douglass was in darkness when he found classic texts. And somehow when he began to read them, before the chains ever left his wrists or his ankles, he became a free man. Once human beings began to search for a meaning to life, light became one of the most powerful metaphors to express depth of life. In that moment, he was reading Cicero, or there's this other dialogue, we're not sure if it was from Socrates, but there's a dialogue between a master and his slave in that text, in the Colombian orator. And in it, there's this discussion happening to, between a master and his slave, we, know, we believe it's an ancient text, and the, mast, and the slave is able to convince his master to set him free. And Frederick Douglass read this dialogue. And when he read it, he says, I realized at that point that I could do the same thing. I could use my words to convince masters to set their slaves free. So as just a teenager, Frederick Douglass decided he had no education. Matter of fact, what he was doing was illegal. He could get himself killed if he were caught. He sets on a journey as a young teen to teach himself rhetoric and logic by reading ancient texts. I mean, when I think about that, I get goosebumps. Like this, this story I'm telling you about Blacks and Classics is not just some cute little story that happened to a couple of people. His story is not unique. We're gonna look at some others. And he, his mind was awakened. So he unchained his mind. And what was used to unchain his mind? Classics. And he was able to think. He was able to see beyond, I'm just a slave. He came in touch with his humanity. All right, so that's Frederick Douglass, all right? And here's, here's another one. W.E.B. Du Bois calls the darkness that maybe Douglass was experiencing, what many African-Americans have felt, this veil. It's not just the evil of slavery or the physical bondage that's there or the physical brutality or, or being ripped from your family, but there's a mental darkness associated with slavery and oppression. Actually, according to Douglas's work, I almost wonder if that was heavier than the chains. They're taken from their native land. They have no access to their native tongue or culture. And, liter and, and literacy of their culture, and they're placed in a space where they couldn't understand anything. So there was no space to think and to wonder, to discover what is true, what is virtuous. All they know is I'm a, I'm a farm animal. I mean, the enslaved people were literally seen as farm animals. The way they wrote their ledger books, you would see slaves listed next to cows and pigs and other domestic animals. And the slave master, as he said, don't teach him to read. Why? Don't awaken thought in him. And if you are reading classics, if you're sitting in classes on your campus and you're engaged in this discussion about a certain text, do you not feel the awakening of your mind and your soul in that moment? That's what Frederick Douglass went through. And Du Bois says, he goes through, he went through something similar. As, an, as in a black man, not enslaved, but he definitely understood oppression. And he, and he, to escape, James Baldwin talks about the burden of being black in America. Du Bois says to escape, he says, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they come all graciously with no scorn nor condescension. So wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. Frederick Douglass was in darkness, veiled by his oppression, by his captivity, and he stepped above that veil as he opened up that Colombian orator. Du Bois says, 
to, to leave the veil of this, this oppressive space that I'm in as a black man in the late 1800s, early 1900s, what do I do? I summon Aristotle and Aurelius. Just before this passage, it says, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. When he got into the canon, when he read class classics, he said, there is no color line. I don't feel that color line. Okay. The river ends between two hills. Follow the drinking gourd. And there's another river on the other side. Follow the drinking gourd. Now, some people may have an issue with me saying classics as a Polaris. I, I am not able, let me just stop share for a minute. I'm not able to change history. I cannot help that this is the story. But I want you to join me in this. The tragedy of what happened to black people was, I, words cannot express. And I, and I say that deeply because my ancestors were enslaved. My grand, we found a book written by my grandmother, my father's fa mother. So my father's in his eighties. So this book was written, my aunt transcribed my grandmother talking about her life. She is the granddaughter of a slave. And in her book, she talks about the pain her grandfather felt, how he says when he was a slave, he would hide behind the barn just to weep. The pain of that was overwhelming. There was nothing they could hold on to. And the only thing they had access to were classics not because they preferred it, not because they wanted to be white. It was the only thing they had. I'm not gonna hide that story because of the racial tensions of this space that we're in. It is just the story and it is true. And so why do they have access? Because I've, there are stories of slaves teasing the masters or tricking the master's children. Hey, Jimmy, what's, what's that? What, what, what are those books you, you read in there? You know, trying to act like he's not really that interested. And little Timmy, who might be seven, eight, or nine, said, Oh, nothing. Uh, uh, Joe, I'm just, you know, this is just a book I have in school. You, you want to, let me see, can you read it to me? That's all they had. Frederick Douglass used to trick the, the neighborhood children by saying, I bet you can't write an A better than I can write an A. Oh, yes, I can. I can write, I can write an A better than some slave, said the children to Frederick Douglass. And he would, and look, they would write an A and say, see, see, I write better than you. And Frederick Douglass would pretend like he couldn't write it, but he was really teaching himself how to write. This access to the literacy, and it was whatever literacy was going on in America at that time. And what was the literacy? The same literacy of the founding fathers. It was classical education. We can't, we can't hide that. We can't deny that. But I love how the African-American people took this only lifeline they had in their situation and used it to fight for their liberation. Okay, I'm almost done. So while enslaved, Douglas read from the Columbian Orator and in it he found truth about his humanity and his freedom. He found the words to fight for all of our liberation. Douglas was not the only one enlightened by classics. Anna Julia Cooper received a classical education after emancipation. And in this next text, she engages in a dialogue with de Tocqueville about the race problem in America. Okay, I have to share this quote with you, okay? Anna Julia Cooper, first of all, was also enslaved, the daughter of the master. She never escapes. She stays enslaved until emancipation. At around 10 years old, she goes to a school that was set up by missionary groups as well as the Freedmen's Bureau. And in this school, it was set up specifically for people who used to be enslaved. And the entire curriculum was classical. They learned Latin, Greek, they, learned, they read classics, they read all types of works of the, of the canon. And she, again, used that to establish her own liberation. And she became a premier educator in the Black community. But she, she says this quote by de Tocqueville. And she said, de Tocqueville years ago predicted that republicanism must fail in America. But if it fails, America fails. And somehow, I cannot think this colossal stage was erected for a tragedy. Listen to the hope of this woman who was enslaved at one time in her life. And she says, I confess, and I feel this with her, to being an optimist on the subject of my country. 
This is the same woman who in her, uh, one of her essays, she says, I did not think my master was worth a sow. He was worth nothing to me. She's able to hold that hurt with regards to her enslavement, but she is able to still see hope in her country and a desire to be a part of making it a more perfect union. She retained so much hope in America, although she was a former slave, she was willing to dwell here and do her part to make our country a more perfect union. She read the text that helped her understand her foreign land. And in doing this, she gained a deeper understanding of her role in this space. She was not seeking assimilation, but equality and inclusion and reading classics gave her the insight to learn how that can happen. Douglas and Cooper did not deny the pain of enslavement or their heritage, but they recognized that this sadly was their home now. James Baldwin expresses an even deeper understanding. I love this quote of why through all of the pain they chose to dwell here and use classics to facilitate that dwelling. Listen to this. I brought to Shakespeare, this is from James Baldwin. This is the same man who wrote, I am not your Negro, okay? And he says, I brought to Shakespeare, Bach and Rembrandt, to the stones of Paris, to the cathedral of Chartres and to the Empire State Building, a special attitude. These are not really my creations. He acknowledges that. They did not contain my history. He acknowledges that. I might search in them forever for any reflection of myself. I was an interloper. This was not my heritage. At the same time, I had no other heritage which I could possibly hope to use. I had certainly been unfitted for the jungle or the tribe. He said, I can't go back to Africa. I was born and raised in New York. I would have to appropriate these white centuries, make them mine. Otherwise, I would have no place in any scheme. This is James Baldwin, who often was speaking against the oppression of Black people. But he too was able to see some value, some purpose for the canon in his life. Where the great big river meets the little river, follow the drinking god. For the old man's are waiting for to carry you to freedom, follow the drinking god. These slaves followed the drinking gourd of classics. They were relentless. They were willing to die to get their hands on these texts. They knew there was no other hope to find their way than to read these texts. Why? Because of the literacy it provided in this country. It was not just African-Americans who have found some type of light by the documents. Let me see if I wanna read this. Ah, yes, um, that have been foundational from, to America. From classics to the constitution, each people group in America has somehow found a place of intersection in the texts of our nation. Classics have enlightened all of us who have touched American soil and somehow through all of that pain and toil, they can, bring us together. One final story. Dr. E. Ashley Harrison wrote this book called The Ebony Column. And I love it because up until this point, I have had issues with Phyllis Wheatley. And in the last two years, I have changed my opinion of her. I used to read her poems and I used to get so frustrated. I'm like, girl, you are just loving slavery a little too much for me. You seem just a little too happy with your situation to me. <laughs> This book by E. Ashley Harrison, he, he, he unpacks some of her poetry. And what she's doing is she's using classics as her Trojan horse. Let me talk to you a little bit about that. And hopefully we all know what Trojan horse is. Um, she was brought to the US from Senegal and purchased in Boston by John Wheatley to be his wife's servant. And they gave her a classical education where she learned Latin, and learn classic texts and Greek. And they say she probably learned Latin and Greek in about 18 months. She became a published poet and used poetry to bring attention to the intellect of black people. She, she had developed a friendship with um, George Washington. She wrote George Washington before he even became president, a poem. And George Washington writes her a letter and says, you have been gifted by the muse, muses. And then he signs it, your humble servant. 
And so she uses this text though. She, she talks about Terence, the African playwright who was from Rome. She talks about uh, the value of Africa. And sometimes I feel like she's being sarcastic. She'll say this pagan land Africa, but now I read it, is she saying that to hide her true feelings about, you think that my people are inferior to you. And she was empowered through her mastery of studying classics. And, and she was the first black person published in America. And, and look, her poetry, her book of poetry was so amazing that people like Thomas Jefferson refused to believe that she wrote it. Thomas Jefferson actually wrote, he does not believe she wrote it. But why? In, see, we don't talk about those stories. When you study this story about the connection of classics to black people, you find this is not just a story about Black people. You find this is a story about how classics brought us together. Phyllis Wheatley was an avid supporter of the Revolutionary War. This is why she valued George Washington. And she was, why? Because she identified with the fight for freedom because she was enslaved. And somehow in her virtue and in her grace, she wanted to see freedom come to people who wouldn't even grant her her freedom. Because she knew maybe if they experience gaining freedom, maybe one day they'll give it to my people. Okay, here we go. Um, and finally, Douglas, while enslaved, would read a speech by John Quincy Adams to his fellow slaves, where Adams condemns the horrors of slavery. Adams, along with Douglas, was proficient in classics, and reading them allowed both men to understand the horrors of it. From the Constitution to the speeches of our founding fathers, classics are interwoven into the American narrative. And it is what connects whites, blacks, even the native people, everyone. All of these documents inspired by classic texts have been used to fight for a more perfect union. And by reading them, we are all given a common literacy to join in the fight to make our country a more perfect union. Martin Luther King says, as we know this truth, as we, I love again, his references to classic texts in a letter from a Birmingham jail. He says, just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and air truths. What are those myths and air truths he's talking about? The myth that black people are inferior. He says to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal. So we must see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help man rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. And finally we end, I try to bring it up as close to contemporary as possible. And I try to go radical on you. So that anyone out in that audience who feels I'm trying to talk about assimilation and just denying our black heritage. The co-founder of the Black Panther, Huey P. Newton, taught himself to read at 18 years old by reading Plato's Republic 10 times. By the 10th time, he understood what it meant. And he was drawn to the, the, the allegory of the cave. And after reading that, he says, I'm gonna do something to free all people. Do you see this? Do you see how these texts have inspired all of us? How my ancestors followed this drinking gourd of classics so that we could all be carried to freedom. Frederick Douglass's autobiography actually talks about, there's a part where he talks about the slave master's wife and how her being taught not to teach him how to read made her turn into an evil person. She became very angry and became really obsessed with the, the power she had as a slave owner. And he talks, he paints this, this sad picture of how racism and slavery didn't just hurt black people, but he uses her story as an example of how it has hurt white people, it has hurt all of us. And I feel like classics, if we read it, if we understand things like the allegory of the cave, where we can leave our comfort zone and what we think to be true and venture out to learn what is true, we can all be set free from these texts, especially as we see how they demonstrate our shared humanity. 
Follow the drinking good. Follow the drinking good. For the old man's awake for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was actually hoping you'd go on for another 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so, um, so now we have uh, quite a bit of time actually for some questions. And um, I'm very happy to see we have lots of students here. Um, we always uh, encourage the first questions come from students. Uh, what you'll need to do is to walk down here and ask the question standing in front of the podium. So. But the Q&A always goes long, so that's why I cut it, cut my talk a little bit. Oh. Would somebody be brave? No? Okay. Well, I'm going to expect somebody's going to come down here, um, but I'll start out. I, I do have a question. I actually have lots and lots of questions, but, um, but I'd like, uh, perhaps you could give a um, suggestion of wh which text have you found have been maybe the easiest way to introduce students into it because I mean you, I'm sure you know we have the development of Western civilization uh, course here and a lot of times um, it's it's a real steep climb for the first you know the first semester because some of those texts are pretty obscure uh, and a lot of students haven't had exposure to them so I mean if you could say a little bit about what um, what you found has been a really good way to um, to get into that. Yes, um, I have found um, Socrates is a great way. Um, students yeah. tend to get a real kick of how he trips people up with their questions, with his questions and his words. And he's pretty clear to understand. He, you, you can pretty quickly understand what he's trying to do to get people to question what is virtue, what is truth, what is friendship, you know? And so, um, and you're able to go on that journey and question with him and it, it almost instantly engages you in that. The other thing I think are um, plays, the plays, the theater, um, the theater of the classical world as well. And just it, it plays even in the canon, just storylines um, are really great. Some, I, I didn't, I personally did not say the Odyssey or myths because sometimes there's so many stories and sub stories, it's easy for people to get lost in it. So the, the first entrance would be, I would say those, those two areas. What up? I'm going to leave me hanging up. No, Bob's just pointing to somebody. There's somebody. All right, month. We have one, a brave student here. Okay. Not a brave student. Sorry, not a brave student. Not a brave student. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Mallory. Uh, thank you so much for coming and talking. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit uh, about how the idea of canon and the role of classics has changed as access to education and Black literacy has changed? Say that question one more time. You can take your mask off. It, it, there's a oh, speaker yeah. right up there. Okay. Yeah, hi. I'm wondering if you can say a little about how the idea of canon and the role of classics has changed as access to education and Black literacy has changed. Well, it's... <laughs> I would have to almost give you another talk to answer that question. So since she said she wished I had 10 more minutes, I'll explain it to you. Um, traditionally, I know there are exceptions to this and there's kind of a renewal going on. There is no access to what we're talking about today. There's not access to classics or the works of the canon. Um, it's, it's actually, it's a pretty big fight to not bring it in, especially to predominantly black public and you know public schools. Um, and then the other piece to that, private schools that want to teach classics and want to bring it to everyone don't want to really connect it to Black history, which makes me sad. Um, and so it's almost like people want to give it as if I'm giving something that belongs to me for you to, to, to share. But that's not what classics is supposed to be. It is it's actually our shared heritage. All of our people have connected to it for different reasons, maybe, right? We've gotten different things from it. We all have our unique stories connected to it. And so, um, so, but that hasn't always been the case. So there was, 
at the beginning, like from Frederick Douglass's time when he was sneaking reading it to emancipation where there were black schools formed that specifically taught the newly freed people classically through the, the rise of Booker T. Washington who taught that you shouldn't, black people shouldn't read classics. Um, and that's so interesting. A lot of people, I, I noticed that a lot of um, classically inspired institutions love to put Booker T. Washington on the reading list. And he was very much against black people reading classics. And his view was that we just need industrial education. We just need to learn a skill to get a good job and just accept your place in society. Don't waste your time learning Latin and Greek. And he actually says this in his autobiography. And so when he rose and he became really popular, especially in the South with Southern whites, many of the, those who supported him were even fought in the Confederate army. Um, there began to be this movement that was partnered with Booker T. Washington and the nation's board of education to go around to schools, removing the classical tradition out of these black schools. By the time desegregation came, they completely shut that down. And black principals who believed in classical education, black teachers who believed in classical education were fired. And they were replaced with people who bought into Booker T. Washington's philosophy. So since that time, Anna Julia Cooper, who I spoke about, actually talked about the sadness she felt about desegregation. She knew this was going to happen. And this is not me saying that I'm against desegregation. I am against how it happened, though, because with desegregation, before desegregation, Black education was managed and carried out by the Black community. And those people had a real care for their students understanding civics understanding the constitution, understanding classics, understanding Latin, being really truly literate beings. And so, but when, when the Board of Education with desegregation took over everyone's education, black superintendents were replaced by white superintendents or superintendents that would do exactly what they were told. Same thing with teachers, same thing with principals. And this, there was a slow removal of the classical tradition from the black community. And we have been stuck there we have been stuck there since. And so there, and sadly though, we would like to see change, but many people have bought into this notion that this, these texts are disconnected from us, but these texts are an integral part of black history. And if we, instead of canceling them or removing them, began to show people how their history is found connected to them, then I think we'd be much better off. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Oh, Hi, I really Hi. Like to talk. Um, I'm a professor here. Uh, my name is Allison Kaplan at um, Allison, the speaker. Oh, right up there. <laughs> okay. but I see myself here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question is: I guess there's a little. There is some debate now. I read an article about Danel Padilla. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes address that controversy. I think it's really interesting hearing what you're saying and then uh, juxtaposing it with what he, there are uh, black intellectuals who are saying that the classics are so problematic, basically because uh, a lot of people in the American South had a classic, the, the white, yep. had a classic education and used kind of their justification of slavery, yep. uh, going back to Aristotle. Who, yep. Yep. Some people are natural slaves, and yep. that, so they use uh, kind of the classic, uh, you know, classic philosophy to justify the enslavement of um, of Africans. Yes. So, and I know that there is, uh, you know, some controversy about whether or how actually yes. classic should be taught. I think that maybe Danielle Padilla right. saying it should be taught, but it should be taught in conjunction with uh, African history as yes. well, or yeah. And it seems like Howard, your university, is bringing those two disciplines together. So yes. you don't just teach classics yep. in isolation. Yes. Thank yes. You. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of people got really upset with Danelle for that article. I like the article, and I hope people aren't mad at me for liking it. I like it because he tells his story from K-12 education into college. And if you follow his story, he's talking about how you know, he came to classics, very similar story to Frederick Douglass, feeling that oppression of living in a homeless shelter. And he finds classics in the homeless shelter library. And he, and then he, he gets so into it, he gets the attention of a photographer, 
and he's he, the photographer gets him into a scholarship in a local classical school private school and that's how his journey began but then he talks about though as he got into that private school and as he went on to college he felt like he had to at first hide who he was like he couldn't coexist as a, a black man from the dominican and a person who loved classics he didn't feel like the two could, could coexist and that's mainly because how classics is taught. I don't think that has much to do with the books, but how it's taught. Sometimes it's taught as this is only the culture that should be acceptable. Anything else that's not this is inferior. So now come study this and deny who you are. What Black people have showed us through their study of the Black classical tradition is a marriage of the two. That the two can coexist and liberate. Again, I was hoping you were going to say more about that. That's just, uh, <laughs> I could listen to you all day. Um, this is uh, this is really interesting. Um, since we don't have a, I, I'm really encouraging a student. Don't be afraid. Come and ask a question. Um, I uh, I find that really interesting. What you just said about um, about the problem is how it's taught. Um, I also I, I don't know. If, probably have something to say also about this, but my impression is that the difference between when I studied classical literature when I was younger many, many years ago, um, there was much less emphasis on things like philology and the structure of the text. Yeah. And, um, it was much more of the ideas that yes. were in yes. the text. Uh, there was more of an emphasis. And it, it's not, I mean, I myself went on to study languages and I am very fascinated by philology, but I feel like there's a way in which the last 30 or 40 years, we've actually lost a lot of yes. what can be inspiring about the classics. Yes. Um, I don't know if you want to say something about that. I do. I mean, I think, and that's the way they're taught. Like even learning Latin, there is just, there's an elitism associated with it. One of the reasons why Du Bois sometimes is rejected is he he would sometimes, and others, like the, the man who wrote Blacks in Antiquity, his name is Frank Snowden, where a lot of my knowledge comes from as well. Um, they were very, they could, and, and, and Alan Locke, the founder of the Harlem Renaissance, the creator of the Harlem Renaissance, there was an elitism, almost that if you don't study this, you are inferior. And that's problematic too. And even in the article with Donnell Padilla, he talks about, being like that, having this attitude of superiority because he felt he had this knowledge. But I, I want us to get back to the humility of those who read it like Frederick Douglass did or Anna Julia Cooper did, um, just for the, the finding of truth, goodness, and beauty and how the, the text speaks to you and inspires you and sharing that. I think if we read it from that perspective, it changes the, it changes the dynamic completely. I think I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I really do want at least one student. I might have to call on one of my students or something. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, uh, here's here's a brave soul. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Nick Small. I'm a first. Hi. Okay. Um, so, my question. So it's evident from your presentation that there are a, a lot of examples of how the classics have really like promoted the advancements of rights for Black people. And this may be in part answered by your description of, of the process of desegregation, but why do you think it is that these stories aren't quite as well known? Because I, I, I think it goes back, I'm, it may, that's a good question, and it makes me sad. It's really sad. It has something to do with the history of education in America. Um, they were well known at one point. Like they, there's even stories of Abraham Lincoln, who I don't think that he finished fourth grade. You know, he, he wasn't educated formally like the found other founding other presidents and founding fathers were. Uh, but he loved to read classics. Even with him being from, he was very, you know, he was raised very poor, but he had access and and he would just walk around spouting Aesop's fables and you know. And so there was a love, and that, that's probably why the enslaved people came to enjoy classics is because. It was very popular at that time. Sadly, and it goes back to what I was saying about how this whole fight for against racism has hurt all of us. Somewhere along the lines of that desegregation and schools being created to meet the needs of all people, there was an erasure of the value of classics and something new was introduced for everyone to have. It, it, there's a story my mom tells, just so I can to prove my point, of the mentality around this, which is really sad. My mom grew up in North Carolina during Jim Crow. And they had a local swimming pool. And 
she was never allowed to go swimming. It was, it was a black, a whites only swimming pool, it was a Jim Crow swimming pool. And then when desegregation happened, they had to open up the pool to black people. The owners closed the pool to everyone. They would let anyone go to the pool. Since so they said, if we have to have black people in here, no one's gonna go. So the neighborhood pool was closed down. So no one ever went swimming. That's a true story, but it kind of gives you a window into the mentality, okay? Where we have to give education equal for everyone. We have to invite black people into our schools. Then no one's getting this stuff. And, I, and that's, and you, and so I, I teach at Howard University, a predominantly black institution, right? And I also, all, I do this on purpose as a method to my madness. I teach full-time at Howard, but every semester I teach adjunct one class at a non-HBCU. So first semester I was at Messiah University. This semester I'm at the University of Maryland. And I do that, and then I end my semester at both campuses, bringing Howard students and, and this semester will be Maryland students into a discussion about the allegory of the cave. But this is what I notice about both. Both groups of people, the predominantly white group and the predominantly black group, have the same educational struggles. I think that's very telling very similar struggles with literacy, with writing. And if they came from the local public schools, I'm not talking about AP, you know, you do have students in each group who maybe went to a private school or were in an AP program and that's different, but like the general population in both groups have the same educational challenges. And this is one reason why places like the classical learning test and a lot of classical associations are trying to bring back classical education. The Catholic community, right, is trying to do this ca a, a classical renewal. I'm part of the Board of Advisors at Catholic University. We're trying to do this ca a classical, um, uh, renewal in K-12 education, because we've come to the place of seeing how important this is to everyone's education. And it's not about white or black. And so I think that the, the struggle of desegregation and the, the right racism and equality made it so now these texts have been de-emphasized. And now we're talking about people are saying things like, oh, let's do culturally relevant pedagogy and so on and so forth. When in fact, this, this is about humanity and it's, so it's relevant to all of us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, I think we have another question. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jim Keating. I'm the director of the humanities program and teaching oh. in Western civilization. Okay. One of the things that, I, I mean, I liked your talk tremendous amount because it, it exudes confidence. One of the things that's happened over, I would say the last 30 years is that um, people who teach these texts have lost confidence in them. They're embarrassed somehow. They are easily dissuaded. Um, and that's why, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't wanna, I mean, the, I think the, uh, the Padilla thing, very, very bad for that. Yes. Um, because you're constantly, and even at this college, you know, where we've had the development of Western civilization for a long time, every year there's a new fight. Every yes, yes. And it's very difficult for people to get up and say, the reason we have this course is because of these books. Yes. Writings. Um, so anyway, I mean, you can comment on that, but I just wanted to give you my gratitude because... The only way these courses survive the access that you so beautifully put is you would think there's a lot of access, but there's not, there's not. We have to keep what we have and then build out yeah. is confidence. Confidence yeah. simply to say, you know, these texts will change your life. They've changed many lives before you and they'll change many after if yeah. you give them a chance. If you give them a chance. And I, I agree with everything you said, even about Padilla's article, the, how it hurt the cause I do because a lot of people read that who were already inflamed and I don't think they really read it well you know they took certain phrases and buzzwords and and even he I'm not sure where his I don't know him so I don't know where his heart is but I read it very differently I read it from a k-12 you know I teach k-12 part of the time and then I'm in colleges too so I can see this broad picture and so his article goes through k-12 to, to college and I'm seeing what happened there. And so, and that, like you said, that confidence, you do see that shame. I mean, at Howard, I'm seen as somebody crazy. I mean, like, I mean, who is this woman who keeps talking about Howard University students need to read classics? And I'm just like, I'm sitting here. And I told them, I said, I'm staying here doing this until you put me out. 
Until you put me out, I'm sitting right here and I'm teaching the same thing over and over. I'm never stopping because that's how that's how important I feel this is. And there's a there's a to, to prove my point. Um, Du Bois has an essay which is beautiful. It's called it's, it's in his book called The Education of Black People, and he writes this essay or it's a lecture he gave at uh, Fisk University called Galileo Galilei, and he talks about how Galileo was willing to deny the truth of what he knew about. The solar system basically or the how the earth revolves around the sun i think i have that right um in order to save his life to to not of course he was about to be put to death for holding to it but also did not feel the rejection of society he, he let go of it and he says let's not be like galileo we know what and it's all about classical education that essay is we know that the power of these texts we know what they have done historically in all people's lives we are not going to deny this truth and yes, we may be upset. I'm not denying what the racism we've gone through, but we can't let the frustration of that to, to, to deny truth. The truth is every single, I'm not just saying some, every single black person in America from when America founded until present day has been inspired by these texts. So if someone says to me, we need to be reading more Toni Morrison, you're not gonna understand anything Toni Morrison says because Sula is based on, I forgot, is it the Odyssey? A lot, not Sula. Song of Solomon is based on parts of the Odyssey. I mean, like every, uh, we need to read more Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston studied classics at Howard. Toni Morrison minored in classics. And so, you know, Martha King, like every, well, we need to be, you know, fight the, you know, Black Power. Well, Huey P. Newton, <laughs> You can't get away from it, whether you like it or not. And if you don't read it, you can't understand what they were saying. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I think I have one more question here. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Thanks so much for your presentation today. It was excellent. Thank you. I had a, I had a question for you. Because I think there's got to be something that could be very effective or helpful here for the future of the classics. And, and that is, is um, first of all, I, I think they're timeless, eternal truths in many ways. And, and a lot of these things, a lot of the classics transcend race, ethnicity, mm -hmm. beauty, goodness, truth, and virtue. So when I was in high school, um, interesting, you mentioned John Hancock, too, because he all the way back in 1635 to high school, <laughs> but uh, Boston Latin. But the um, we started learning the classics in the seventh and eighth grade, and so like the eighth grade we had ancient history, and, and you know whether it's the discourses of Epictetus or, or yes. a of things where you learn about the classics, they help you live a better life with yeah. with virtue. It's been said that some may think they're an ornament to prosperity, but they're actually a refuge in in adversity. In they help guide us in so many different ways, but is there a way to actually teach them at a much younger age or start younger so people can start to appreciate them? Yep. So come to a college, I know when I came to, Pro when I was at Providence College, some people may have had a disdain for, um, for Western State. I actually loved it. Um, but to be able to learn how to think, to be able to learn how to speak, to be able to learn how to write, mm -hmm. these are basic, Basic um, strength. Yes. Yeah. No, matter, no matter what you do in, in life, I know yeah. you, back to high school, you had to speak. You had to give a get up and give a public speech. Yeah. Four, four out of your five semesters, and it had to be at a minimum like four minutes long. Yep. So I mean, I, I think there's got to be some way where they can be incorporated into edu education at a much younger age. Yeah. So that there's an appreciation for them. I don't know what, what do you think? Yes, I'm at I, I, and that's why I love classical education. K twelve, like there's a lots of K twelve curricula. My favorite being Memoria Press is probably my favorite classical, even though they don't represent the color of my skin very well. But you know, I I, I insert as I need to. But the structure of it um, is really great for introducing young children all the way up from little preschool through twelfth grade to classical education. There's another piece to this. Um, there's another curriculum called Touchstones, which takes excerpts of classic texts and students read them and discuss them. And they start as young as 
lower elementary and go all the way up through high school. Junior grade books is another one that has a curriculum. So this way you're introducing young children to reading text. Um, Charlotte Mason used to say, don't try to avoid children's versions of text. Instead, give them the actual text, but in smaller pieces. Yeah. And, I, and it actually works. So I, you know, right now I'm calling, I am at the school that I founded, we are, we introduce the students to the text through reading small bits of the actual text, not the children's version. And we avoid the children's version as much as possible. The only children's version we've used is, I can't remember the name, but it's a, it's a, it's a big book for kids to understand Greek mythology and it's written for children with illustrations and everything. I love that book, it's amazing. That's the closest I've gotten to a children's version most times because I wanna just make sure. And then early readers, there's some um, K-12 curriculum that make early readers. I'm gonna show you like, for example, um, let me see if I get like this. These are my daughter's books, her readers, and they're called uh, um, what is it called? Early early classics. I can't remember, but I love it. Like they have in here, Tom Sawyer, uh, and all of those books. I think another one is let's see some other ones, but um, and that and so she's introduced and they and and so here we go. Like. Here we have just the one part of when Tom Sawyer is painting the fence. Okay, I know this is just a small example. My daughter's just learning to read. She's in second grade. And she's introduced to Tom Sawyer here, you know? And, and that was so cool because she comes to me one day and she says, mommy, if you had a child like Tom Sawyer, I think he would just go insane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what, what I found joyful about it is they're not, these are all black kids and they love themselves. They love their heritage. These are kids who wear cornrows and Afro puffs and love hip hop and all that. But they, they're reading these texts without feeling like, oh, why are these white people here? Like, we've got to get out of that color line, that veil that Du Bois talks about. And I think that's the one thing that's hurting us. And I always feel, I, I love what the, the, the gentleman, I think who's the head of the humanities program, he just said, I don't think we're going to be successful if we keep trying to do it on a big scale. We're going out changing everybody's mind. I don't think we're going to do that. But strengthening from within the schools, the colleges, um, organizations that really believe in this, if we become confident in what we have, recognizing that most, a lot of people may not like it, but you know what it's doing for you and you be confident in it and then you grow it this way. Um, because I, and th things like that, even having that conversation with my daughter is again, a deposit into my faith in this, in this stuff, you know? Well, thank you so much. I really hope we can have you here in person at some point. <laughs> we'd love to. We'd love to host you in person. Yeah. Um, and and also, I'd be very interested in um, if you have the the name of that book, the the, the thick book that you were just talking about with the uh, with the for, that you use for children. The class. No, no, this no. one, no. Blacks in Antiquity. Oh, uh, is that the one? What was it about? What was it connected to? You said you were just talking when you were just talking about using it in teaching uh, young kids, children, the book for children. Is it, or is it, it's not the reader classics, is it touch tones? No. Junior grade books? Mythology. With all the illustrations. Oh, yes, yes. And I could, if I could. Mm. Well, when you, find, when you find it, so well, I will send you the link to it. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I've, been, I've been writing everything else down. So. Yes. Well, thank you so much. You're and, welcome. Uh, uh, you know, we wish you the best of luck with the uh, with all of your work and everything. And hope thank you. To you thank you, and thank you so much for having me, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. <laughs>